to the third box suite is a very fun and playful piece. You know, all of the other cello suite alamans are very smooth and singing, lots of slurs and long smooth lines. It's only this alaman to the third suite that has kind of a, a bouncy quality to it. At least that's how I feel it. Um, you know, alamans are typically the slower and little heavier movement compared to the karat is the main thing. Compared to the karat, the alaman, the slower and heavier. But I like the light strokes for this one. If we play with longer strokes, it gets too thick for my imagination. I like it to have a light quality, even like a little sense of humor. Now, the, there's a few ideas that we want to apply through the whole piece. One of them is, as always, a variety of dynamics. Uh, using our dynamics to help support a line that's rising or falling, or to support the idea that maybe there's two different voices, make one voice stronger, one softer. Another idea is that there's, um, there's different layers in the music. Uh, some notes are more important, want to be kind of in the foreground. Other things can be voiced into the background. And that's a good word, voicing. You know, pianists talk about voicing all the time, that one finger might play louder than the other finger. And so we're not playing a lot of notes at the same time, but that idea of voicing, which notes deserve to be brought out to the foreground and which notes can be left in the background, is a, is a valuable way of, to think about this piece. So right off the bat, you have arpeggios that are want to come out. So he outlines this, well, there's scales here, but the way the scale stops and turns around, it outlines a C major chord. fast 30 second notes, but there's a little scale in the bass line. A. And then, at 
after that little sequence, a cadence in C major to kind of tie things up for this first big phrase. And so I like to take just a hint of time here, because it's the end of a phrase, and when we go down the C octave, I like to make the lower C a little more relaxed, as we often do if we're playing a um, Haydn or Mozart string quartet. You know, at the end of a phrase, sometimes the cello has that very last word with a kind of a rebounding bass note, and usually it's nice to give it a little diminuendo. Well, speaking of rebounding, I like the analogy of, of if you drop a ball, the second bounce is lower. So I like the second bass note to be a little lower in dynamic. And then off on a new phrase. This note is interesting because it's the first accidental in the piece. We've just been all in C major no sharps or flats up till here, but now finally, after really establishing C major, after establishing C major so solidly, now Bach starts off on an adventure in harmonies. And I drop back my dam dynamic here just a little bit, so I have room to crescendo. When I go up that scale in thirds. And so, uh, yeah, you heard my intonation was far from perfect, so give it a good workout. Leave out the low C's. There, I found it. So, sorry about that last one. So give it a good workout in sustained double stops so that your ear and your hand are working well together. Hey, and when you shift from one third to another, I think it's good not to pick up the fingers. Let the fingers stay in place and just, you know, you'll lighten up the weight on your fingertips a little bit when you make your shifts. Um, but it's good to keep fingers down. Oh, if you pick up fingers, it's much chancier about the intonation of the next one. So keep fingers down and... The way I just played that scale in sustained thirds, that's what my left hand will do when I play the passage in context. sharp. And here again, there's a scale hidden in the music. C, B, A, and so forth. G. And so it's very fun to bring that up. Oh, and then as soon as we get down to the bottom, he does a little scale back up to balance things out. F sharp, G, A, oh, and now back down. We had a B, A, G, F sharp, E. So it's very fun to recognize these scales that are sort of the framework that the fuller busy 16th and 32nd notes are, are are sort of draped across. Very fun to realize those scales that are the framework and kind of bring them out just a little bit with your sound. Sometimes I slur the 32nd notes 
plus the next note. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I slur four notes. And I think that could be a personal choice. When you slur four and separate, you're going to play legato anyway. Change into up bow makes it speak a little differently, but I think that can be a player's choice. And maybe study the manuscripts by Anna Magdalena Bach and also by Bach's student Peter Kellner. Tell you the truth, I forget what markings are there, but it's good to be informed by those source materials. So same ideas in the second half. Uh, we start out in G major here, and again, that same idea. There's a scale down, but in that scale, there's an arpeggio that is the framework. And of course, the important notes are the notes on the beat, and especially the notes on the first and third beats of these measures in 4-4 time. Hey, also, just a little detail about fingering, you know. In my edition, I put a choice of fingerings. I think the way I've been playing it today is, and then I shift for fourth finger when I run out of fingers in the fourth position. Another alternative, and I think it's player's choice, just whichever makes you clearer. Uh, you know, when you shift four to four, it's a very short shift. It's only a half step. times when we shift at that small half step interval it gives us a chance to be clear you just have to be careful if you use that finger that it doesn't become smudgy you know I mean fourth finger is on G and fourth finger is on F sharp and we don't want to hear anything in between you know as with any good shift you'll use your arm and so maybe to be uh, conscious of having an energized arm will help that four to four shift. By comparison, the other fingering, that's actually quite a long shift. I mean, the interval from E to D is a whole step, but you're going from fourth position to first position. So your shift is actually the interval of a fourth, pretty long shift. But somehow I like it for a couple of reasons. Um, when I jump to fourth finger, I can help my clarity with a little hint of percussive action in my fourth finger. And also I think something at play here is when we practice our scales, when we are coming down, we do that shift all the time, hundreds of times a day maybe, if we're practicing our scales on a... In whatever key it is, we practice this shifting down a fourth from first finger to fourth finger. We practice it all the time, so I think that's why I like it in this instance in the Bach Alamon, because my hand has done that thousands and thousands of times over the years in scale practice. in harmony. I think this G sharp is saying E major as a dominant of A minor. It's important, even though we're not singing or playing a breathing instrument, wind or brass instrument, musically it's important to feel where to take a breath. It helps us phrase well, and actually it's helpful if we give the audience a chance to take a breath once in a while too. So after that E is a place to take a breath. <laughs> solid way. Let's see, so play this run as if it's a pickup. And it's not a pickup to that note. The it's all a gesture which is a pickup to the next downbeat. Mm -hmm. 
How to play this chord. Um, some cellists are flexible enough they can bar those notes and play the A string, but I can't bend backwards enough with my fingers to clear the A string. Another method that you see some cellists do is they bar the fifth and just get out of the way. But um, my fingertip is fat enough that I can have some arch in my first finger, especially if I kind of experiment and find a little bit of an angle. I can play this fifth and arch over the A string. So each player will have their own way to solve this based on the, the make of their hand and maybe how wide or how close their bridges are based on how, their, their, how, how wide or close their strings are based on how their bridge was cut. So every, place, every player has to find their own solution. For me, I can arch and stop both strings. You know what? I'm not stopping them solidly. It's like I'm in between the strings, and each string is like three quarters stopped. Now since it's three quarters stopped, it'll sound flat, so I have to compensate by aiming slightly high to... I aim too high to have my fifth in tune with the open A string. But as I was saying, each player has to find their own answer for, for that particular challenge. So he establishes A minor finally. More harmonic adventures, a B flat. I think saying that we're headed towards a harmony in F major, I would predict. There's no trill printed there, but somehow in my memory I have a trill on the in the on the A in my memory. set up F major, it was to set up D minor at measure 19. And then once we get to measure 19, again we have these uh, sequences where there's a scale buried inside the passage work. E, D, C. You know, we had this parallel passage in the first half, right? solid F major. That's part of a cadence heading towards C. Except there's a little bit of sense of humor here. It's not a C major chord. It sets up like it's going to be. But it's a deceptive cadence. And so I like to take a little bit of time here to to be kind of coy. I mean, deceptive cadences are sort of a form of a musical joke, and so I like to take a little time, just as if I'm giving a wink and a nod to what has just happened there, that it's set up to be something, and then it wasn't. <laughs> Major for real for the finish of the piece. Mm -hmm. 